Well, good morning. This morning, in the vein of a fellow minister of the gospel, I'm wearing my cardigan to honor another minister whose name that we're familiar with when it comes to neighbors and neighborhoods. His name was Mr. Fred Rogers. Mr. Rogers Neighborhood. How many of you remember it? The cardigan, the flip in your shoes. He was a minister who wanted to teach children what it means to live in community and be a good neighbor. He just happened to use the medium of TV. I feel really old (laughs) because I want to say here, like I'm going to say it, then I'm going to pretend like I didn't say it, okay? I want to say here in this moment, man, where did shows like that go? But that makes me feel old. So I didn't say that. I just thought that together. But I do think it's, it's an amazing. So I'm wearing my card again this morning. I didn't want to have it hanging up. I didn't want to skip across here. That's Fred's deal, not mine. Um, but I am wearing my card again. We are talking about how to neighbor. And that impacts and, and touches every single one of our lives. And today we want to talk about empowering those who are in need. And I believe there's a bit of a prophetic edge to what we're going to share today. In particular because of the time and season in which you and I live Today, our growth step is that we want to count the cost that making a difference will make or will take from our lives or what it looks like in our lives. And part of our How to Neighbor series was also clarifying what it looks like for us as a community to continue to do missions. How do we bring some clarified focus around that? And Pastors Barry and Kim last week did an exceptional job, an extraordinary job, talking about what it looks like to protect vulnerable people. It was extraordinary to catch online just to see how it is that they shared that together, whether it was Children's Aid Society and the FOI that was blown away by our response or your response as a community. How many know it's important to protect those who are vulnerable? As well, too, helping people out of poverty. You know, today there's, there's many different types of poverty. There's not just physical poverty. There's actually relational poverty. With the advent of social media, we are connected like never before. But one of the things that's, that the researchers are now finding is that when we're connected like we're never before and we get the chance to peer into each other's lives as never before, it's actually amplifying loneliness. Isn't that interesting? And so there's a the relational loneliness. And then, of course, there's this, or, or poverty, excuse me. And then there's a spiritual poverty as well. We also want to talk about what it means to plant and revitalize churches, how significant and important that is. And it's not a self-serving mission. It is planting a church in a city for 15, 20, 100 years, making a difference in a city. So it's a totally different vision. We'll speak more to that next week. And lastly, we'll be talking about resourcing strategic partnerships. The Life Center doesn't have to do everything. But we want to partner with those who are doing something to help them achieve their mission further and faster than we could by starting what it is that we're doing. One of the things that we have been saying during this entire series is this, is that you cannot be everything to everybody. You'll burn yourself out. But you do have to be something to somebody. You do have to engage somewhere that beautifully breaks your heart. There's got to be something as a follower of Jesus that you engage with that does something that causes you to take a faith step, you to be reliant on Jesus, you to pray prayers that you've never prayed, you to sacrifice in a way that you've never sacrificed. Maybe you can't do it with everything, but you can do it with something. And it's important for each and every one of our lives. And so today, there's, when it comes to empowering those in need, I want to remind us today that we are not only natural, but we are spiritual. And I want to take two things that oftentimes seem to live apart, and I want to stand in the middle, and I want to pull both of them. I want, more importantly, I'm not doing it. I want God's Word to pull both of those things into focus in our lives. Because there are some of us today, especially with the world in which we live, that are becoming fatigued by its brokenness. We are becoming overwhelmed by its brokenness. Those of us who are compassionate and empathetic have empathy in our hearts, are growing discouraged. But it seems it doesn't matter what we do, things aren't changing. In fact, it seems as though they may even be getting worse in some situations. And so some things are, it's an important season to look at. I am guilty. Jesus said these words, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. And then he promised and said, I will give you rest. I am not proud to admit, but it's taken me a while and I still fail from time to time. And I want Jesus to transform this part of my life. That in coming to Jesus, how many know that you can come to Jesus and you can still never put your burden down? You can still never trust him with it. 
you can still actually never let him carry it for you. And some of us are doing it when we look at our individual lives, maybe family lives, but the world in which we live in. We're coming to Jesus, but we're not allowing Jesus to save us. We're not allowing Jesus to heal us. We're not allowing Jesus to set us free because somewhere along the way, we believe that we are the Savior, the healer, and the one who brings freedom. And how many know that Jesus is Savior, Jesus is healer, and Jesus is the one who wants to bring freedom however he wants to use our lives, but the work that we're doing for God isn't meant to destroy our own souls. And so it's in that space that we want to talk talk this morning. Two scriptures. You can turn or tap in your Bible if you have it. First one is in Matthew chapter 25, verses 35 to 40. And here's what it says. One day Jesus was talking about eternal things, and he said this. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. And then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you a drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king, everybody say the king. And the king, King Jesus, will answer them, truly I say to you, as you did it for one of the least of my brothers, As you did it for the least of these amongst you, you did it as an act of worship for me. And so there is something about how we minister in the city in which we live and the families which we're a part of, the church we're a part of. As we minister, there is something about doing it, and that too is an act of worship unto Jesus. And so on the natural side of things, we're going to talk about that in a minute. But now I want to pull you to the other side, and I want to pull you to the spiritual side of things, because one day Paul was talking about walking in love in various relationships, and he said this, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Everyone say, strong in the Lord, strength in his might. It didn't say be strong in your strength, in your wisdom, in your bank account, in your intellect, in your spiritual gifts, in your compassion or your empathy. It said, Paul is saying, no, no, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Turn to someone around you and say, you're not my problem. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and have shoes for your feet, having put them on with the readiness that given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, everyone say all circumstances. In all circumstances, not just some. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, which, which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying. Everybody say praying. This is the key word right here. Praying at all times in the Spirit with prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication or praying for all the saints, praying for those who are following Jesus, praying for those who are making a difference, praying for those who are weary. Pray, pray, pray. So what's the tension? Well, the tension reminds me of a story that we talked about in the summer of a little boy and his lunch. This tension that we're talking about where Jesus said, you're going to see people who are hungry and thirsty, naked. You're going to see people that are sick and imprisoned. You're going to see all of these things in your life, and I want you to do something natural. And then Paul is saying, on the other side, I want you to do something that is spiritual, recognizing that every problem that you see isn't only natural. There is a spiritual dynamic taking place as well. Two things he's pulling on. It reminds me of his story, and we talked again, we talked about in the summer, when Jesus was teaching, and there were 5,000 men who were there, so multiply that by women and children, a massive crowd of people. And he was teaching, and, and he wasn't trying to fit his sermon into 30 minutes. He was going a little longer. He was doing some extraordinary things, and a whole crowd, thousands of people gathered him out, followed him out into the wilderness, and when he finished, he realized, "Uh uh-oh, they were hungry. 
and we don't have anything here. We didn't, we didn't set up a buffet. We didn't like, cater it out. And there's a problem. And every adult looked around and went, uh-oh, there's a problem. But a little boy, everyone say a little boy. A little boy, innocent enough, took his five loaves and a couple of fish, and he offered it to Jesus. Why a little boy? Again, because adults would have rationalized that the need is too big that I can't actually make a difference. What difference is my lunch going to make? That's why it takes a little kid to take a step of faith and go, well, Jesus, what can you do with this? What the little boy gave Jesus was so inadequate for the need at hand. However, it wasn't the little boy's responsibility to meet the adequacy or the inadequacy of the need. It was simply his responsibility to give what it is that he had. Notice the little boy couldn't give what he didn't have. But he could give what he had. And so in this story, he gives what he has to Jesus. He gives what he has to Jesus. He does what he can do in the natural And then Jesus does what only Jesus can do. And Jesus multiplies it to meet the needs of all of those who were present. And so the tension that we're talking about this morning is empowering others, is doing what we can do. However, it is asking God simultaneously to do what only he can do. Because doing what we can, excuse me, as an act of worship for Jesus is always essential. When it comes to making a difference, when it comes to protecting those who are vulnerable, when it comes to the world in which we live in, when it comes to empowering those who are in need, when it comes to being a neighbor, you are going to have to face every single day the inadequacy of what it is that you feel you have to offer to make a difference. It's something that all of us are going to face just the, the sheer scope of some of the challenges that our world is facing. And sometimes it can feel like, what is, what is this going to do? What is a smile going to do? What is, what is me taking someone out to lunch going to do? Has anyone here ever, ever just begun to engage with someone? And they begin to tell you their, their problems. And the more they begin to tell you their problems, the more inadequate you begin to feel. Anybody ever get themselves in over their head? Where you think, man, I just think I was just, just doing this. I am so stricken by Jesus' words to us, which we just read a moment ago in Matthew 25, where he says, for I was hungry, and you just gave me food. It didn't say that you, you ended systemic poverty in and of yourself. It just simply said that you just gave food in this moment. Or he says, I was sick, and Jesus didn't even say, you came to the hospital bed and saw me healed, it simply said that you just came and visited me. You just put yourself in an environment for me to use your life. That's all I'm asking you to do. I'm not asking you to change the atmosphere and do all these things. I'm simply inviting you to come and to visit. Or he said, you go to, you go to see someone in prison. I'm not asking you to do all of these things. I'm just asking you to go visit. Now, other places in Scripture, we begin to do more, and we can do more together, absolutely, because we don't only want to see somebody hunger in hunger, in hunger fed. How many know that we want to see systemic poverty broken as well? So it's not an either or thing, but sometimes in the immensity of the challenge, we can actually say, the problem is too big, therefore I can't or I won't, because what difference will I make? And this morning, Jesus is saying, let's allow that to be completely obliterated from our thinking and from our hearts. Because the difference that we make in a moment is, Pastor Lori said during hosting a moment ago, it's being willing enough to take the step of faith, to put yourself in the environment to be used by God. You will feel inadequate. You will feel at times overwhelmed. You will feel at a place that, God, I don't know what it is. I don't know how you're going to do this. But, God, I'm just going to do what only I can do. And in this moment, I can give somebody some food. Maybe it doesn't end poverty or change anything, but God, in that moment, may they see your kindness. I can give drink. Giving someone a drink isn't going to end their thirst forever, but it's temporary. God, this is something that I can do. Again, giving clothing, you you can see it over and over and over again. Empowering others, it always starts with doing what we can. You can't give what you don't have, but what Jesus is saying to all of us this morning when it comes to being a neighbor is what you do have to give Give that. Remember, you can't be everything to everybody, but you can be someone and by doing something 
for an individual. You can do that. I can do that. We can do something. You can't fix every cause. You can't heal every need. You can't be doing everything, but there is something that you can do. And there are some of you, there are some of you today who you need to get in the game because you're looking at your own inadequacies. You're looking at your own inabilities but you're not seeing what can happen if you take your little and put it in the hands of a mighty God. And you're putting yourself on the sideline, but when you became a follower of Jesus, there is no sideline. There is no benches. There's just a field of play. And your teammates are counting on you to fully engage this with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and with all your strength as worship unto Jesus. There is a space that we are called to do this. One of the things that I also notice in the text that I think is incredibly liberating in what Jesus said, and some of you can be set free in this puberty. Some of you can be set free in this. That's one of my favorite jokes. Some of you can be set free in this moment is notice what Jesus does do in this text as well. You're not responsible to how somebody else interprets what it is that you're doing. You may see someone who's hungry and you may give them a meal and for them they may say it's inadequate. You can do this, you can do this, you can do this, you can do this. That's not what Jesus is asking you to do. He's just asking you to do something. You're not responsible to fill their cup. You're responsible to empty yours. You're responsible to empty your cup. You're not responsible. The scripture doesn't say that my my God shall supply all their needs according to your riches and glory. That's not what it says. You're not their savior. I'm not their savior. We can't be their savior. And so it's a beautiful place of doing, this is what I can do. But God, I'm not just doing what I can do. I'm trusting you to do what only you can do. And that's the second point, is asking God to do what only he can is also essential. And so if the one hand of Matthew was talking about these practical things that all of us can do, then I want to pull over to the Paul side of it where he's talking about, look at our struggles not against flesh and blood. Our struggle is not just against others, that there are spiritual dynamics at play that we have to be aware of. You have a spiritual enemy that wants to rob, kill, steal, and destroy. Well, what does he want to rob, kill, steal, and destroy? Everything and everyone. Okay? Here's my favorite example. Because what Paul talked about is not only putting on all the armor of God. First of all, you got to ask yourself a question. Why in the world is Paul talking about armor? Because whether you know it or not, the moment you gave your life to Jesus, in fact, those of you who are here and you're not yet giving your life to Jesus, it's the same reality for you. The reality is that there is spiritual warfare taking place all time over the world in which we live. As a follower of Jesus, you're in a battle. I don't want to be in a battle. You don't have a choice. You don't have a choice. You don't have a choice. But you will find... That when you recognize that you're in a battle, and as a follower of Jesus, here's what the scriptures actually says, that Jesus, what he did be on a bloodstained cross, an empty tomb, and a poured out Holy Spirit, it said that he overcame all the works of the enemy. Not some, not half, not three quarters, all the works of the enemy. So you don't fight for victory, you fight from victory. However, that doesn't mean that you're not still in a battle. Doesn't mean you're not still in a battle. And what Jesus said, or what, what Paul is saying in, in Romans, that we, or Ephesians that we see, is that one of the primary ways in which we engage these things is through prayer. A moment ago I alluded to it, now I'll pull it back forward. This is my favorite example. I use it all the time because it affects, it touches every one of our lives. Everybody can relate to this. If you don't believe you're in a spiritual battle, set aside time to spend with Jesus in prayer and watch all hell break loose. Man, you, you, you may say, I'm going to spend time with Jesus tomorrow morning at 7. I'm going to spend time with Jesus. And then you make that decision the night before. You go to bed nice and early. And when 6.45 rolls around and your alarm clock was off that next morning, you are going to be more tired than you've ever been in your entire life. You say, well, I'm going to spend time with Jesus at 5 o'clock. At 5 o'clock, you're going to have every device you own buzzing and beeping. You're going to find yourself on YouTube going down the rabbit hole where all of a sudden you're like, I have, I have no idea how now I'm watching cars get fixed by rabbits and like, 
You're like, I don't, know what's, I don't even know what's going on anymore. I don't know how I got here. But all I know is two hours just went by. Okay, I'm going to spend time with Jesus before I go to bed. And you're like, well, just one more season of a show. <laughs> Not even one episode because you're an overachiever. You're like, it's like, one, like one more season. One more season. You don't do anything halfway. <laughs> and so it doesn't seem to much matter what time you pick. Or maybe you actually find the time and you go to pray. But you know what? You can't get this to shut off. Things that you never even think about. Every email. Did I leave the stove on? How are the kids? Da, 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 da. I mean... It's just called spiritual, war, spiritual warfare occurring around your life. Why? Here's why. Because it's not your job to fill someone else's cup up. It's your job to empty out your cup. And here's what the enemy knows. If he can rob you spending time with Jesus, then you go around with a half full cup. In fact, for some of you, you go around with almost an empty cup. Because spending time with Jesus is where he pours back in. There is this spout of heaven. That in dry seasons, the prayer is, Lord, send your rain on this dry and thirsty soul. Send your rain. Lord, what I need, the sustenance that I need as a husband, as a father, as a, as a man, the sustenance that I need in whatever context that you're in, that's what the enemy wants to rob. So in a moment, it feels like, oh, it's legalism. Why should I spend time with him? Oh, it's this, it's that. And it doesn't feel like a big deal until you go to pour out and you realize you don't have a lot left to pour. And if you've ever been through a season where you're feeling a little dry, you're feeling a little, there's not, there's not much in there, something grabs a hold of your soul and it's called scarcity. That the less we believe we have, the more we guard what we have. I can't give it away now. I don't have compassion to give. I don't have anything to give. And drip by drip and little by little. You see, the enemy doesn't rob from you oftentimes in one big crisis. Though that happens from time to time, actually, no. Most of the times, it's in drips and drabs each and every day that you don't notice until you go to pull on something and it isn't there. There is this supply of God that he wants for our hearts and lives so that when we pour out, we've got stuff to pour. How many know that we can't change a world that we're the exact same substance of? Sometimes for some of us, before you post, make sure that you pray. Before you engage that discussion, maybe remind yourself, my struggle's not against flesh and blood. As annoying as they are, as wrong as they are, as much wisdom as they need. All right? Remind yourself. This morning when you woke up, Jesus loves you so much as a Canadian, he just wanted to remind you that though your sin is as scarlet, it should be white as snow. And he's reminded you this morning of his goodness and his grace. I don't know about you, but sometimes I would rather live in Hawaii where the sun rises with healing in its wings. That's where I want to live, but, but I don't. For those of you who are new to Canada, you're new to Canada, um, no, this isn't bad yet. Buckle up. For those of you who are not new to Canada, may I simply remind you, when you woke up this morning, you went, really? Where, if you've been living here for more than five, ten years, every year like clockwork, this happens. How did this surprise you? Because all of us remember that one green Christmas we had a few weeks, you know, a few years ago where it was like 20 degrees, and we went, you know, global warming is actually not that bad. Like, we didn't have a problem with it. Sorry, climate change. All right? We... But, you know, that wasn't the norm. This is the norm. So can I say something as your pastor this morning? Thank you this morning that when you woke up and looked outside, for some of you, like, Lori, you went like, yay. But for everybody else whose Jesus is healed, you looked outside and you went like, oh, man. I want to say, just joking, Lord. I want to say thank you. I want to say thank you to each and every one of you today who made a decision in spite of what you feel, to live by values, and you got yourself to church this morning serving and engaging. <laughs> to each of you who are kids and students who had no choice because your parents brought you anyways, <laughs> let me say you got good parents. To those of you online, <laughs> no shame. None, because I know some of you live where it's just, it, was, it, was, it was too difficult this morning. Can I also say, though, that because you're a Canadian and a Christian, 
Uh, Jesus is going to give you lots of opportunities to this, this whole year on Sundays to exercise value over your feelings. So we look forward to seeing you <laughs> in a week to come. No, but seriously, no shame. No shame. No shame. Tell the person beside you and say, yeah, right. <laughs> no, seriously, no shame. We're, we're glad that you've joined us. It's a wonderful thing that we can do. However, why I say this too is that, um, okay, there are some of you, though, that are online who it's become a convenience, and I want you to know that online is no substitute for community. I'm not saying what you're doing is wrong. I'm simply saying that we miss you, and there's a difference that your life makes, and though everyone may not notice if you're here or not, I want you to know it matters, and you matter. And so for those of you who couldn't and you're online, awesome, but if you could... Do you, do you know what's happening online? Log off, log off, log off. <laughs> yeah, yeah, long, online was really down this week. I wonder why. I wonder why. Spiritual warfare can get weird. But it's exactly what I just articulated. You wake up and you just think, ah, I'm good. You have an opportunity to serve and you think, bah, someone else. That's where it shows up in all of our hearts and lives. But there are some of you who that's not your story. And your story is you give and you give and you give and you give and you give. And you pray, and you pray, and you pray, and you pray, and you pray. And you're just discouraged. Today, you don't need to beat down. You need someone at the end of the service just to carry you to Jesus because the burdens just become heavy. And you need someone to carry you to Jesus and just have a moment of your soul where they just put you under the, they just put you under the spout and let them just begin to fill your cup afresh. There are others of us today. Beware of the familiarity that you can have with Jesus. That you can become so, we can become so common with hearing about the things of God that we have no more faith. We can become so discouraged by what we don't see that we can't see him for who he is. In Matthew 13, verse 58, Jesus went back to his own town, his, his hometown, and they couldn't see Christ because all they could see was a carpenter. And what it actually says there, it says he didn't do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. Failure to see Jesus for who he is. Why bother? He's just this. One of the challenges of spiritual warfare for every one of our lives is simply this. Allow God to define who he is. Do not allow your circumstance to define who God is. Those two statements are very, very simple. Allow God to define who he is. Don't allow your circumstances to define who God is. Those two statements are very, very simple, but they are the spiritual warfare of a lifetime to keep those things intact. Because what a human, if you're a human being, it is so hard not to allow your circumstances to define who God is. That is what spiritual warfare feels like. There's a heartbreaking story in Mark chapter 9 of a father and his deeply troubled son. When Jesus said to them, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but by prayer. That there's a spiritual dynamic taking place here, not just a natural dynamic. There is something spiritual taking place that you're not going to break it in the natural if we only minister as followers of Jesus naturally, but we don't trust for the supernatural of God, we will find ourselves not seeing the stories that God wants every single one of us to live. 
And it's a challenge because it's easier sometimes just to live over here because, again, this world can get so confusing and it can get so odd and it can get so misunderstood. But the reality is if you pull all that away, it is this place of praying. And I love to say this. There are some of you as parents or some of you as grandparents that prayer is never a last resort. Prayer is always a first response Prayer is not, well, I've done everything I know to do and nothing works, so I guess I'll pray. Do everything you know to do and simultaneously ask God to do what God alone can do. Well, what if I don't see it happening? That's why Paul said just a moment ago, persevere, engage, get other people around you to pour some, their cups out on you when you're discouraged, when you need some fresh encouragement into your soul. Jesus himself said this, that no one can enter a strong man's house. Everyone say no one. No one. No one, doesn't matter how rich you are, how wise you are. No, no, no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man. Then indeed he may plunder his house. What is Jesus saying? That there are powers and principalities, our struggles not against flesh and blood, that sometimes those things have to be bound in order for you to get what it is through that God is doing. That is not natural. That is spiritual. That is not done this way. That is done this way. That there are things that we see. Did you know, by the way, let me give you some just practical examples. Uh, did you know, by the way, that, that money doesn't solve money problems? Some of you are saying, well, I'd like to try. <laughs> but it actually doesn't. Study after study after study shows. Canadian studies show that the more someone's income goes up, their, simultaneously their giving goes down. Did you know that 90% of National Football League players, 90% of National Football League players are bankrupt usually within a year, six months to a year after their career comes to an end, though they sign multi-million dollar contracts. Money doesn't solve money problems. Did you also know that 89% of statistics are just made up on the spot? <laughs> that was a joke. Not the first one, the second one. Did you know you could study lottery winners? Turn to the person beside you and say, don't go there. You can study lottery winners in the vast majority. If we don't learn, if we don't learn, 10% belongs to Jesus, 10% should go into savings, and we live on 80%. I mean, that's, that's, that's not rocket science, but I think that's what stewardship is. By the way, God is not interested only in the 10% of your finances. He's, listed, he's interested in 100% of your finances, which includes stewardship. 10% is just one part of it. He's also really interested in the 90%. We'll leave that for another series. Has anyone here ever sat across from somebody and you shared wisdom towards their life? You knew it was wisdom because you went, holy moly, I should actually live that. <laughs> and you amazed yourself at what came out? And part of you wanted to go, write that down. <laughs> write that down. I'll never remember that. Tweet that. Put it on the Facebook. Put it, put, put it out on the line. Put it out on the line. Because I'll never remember that. But come on, has anyone here ever poured wisdom? How do you know that pouring out wisdom doesn't stop someone from making a foolish decision? In one ear, out the other. Sometimes it doesn't matter how much you love somebody. Your compassion alone can't change a circumstance unless they want help and change. And in those moments, you and I are going to be very, very tempted to go, well, my struggle is flesh and blood. But the scripture reminds us, no, there may be a spiritual dynamic here, that you are not powerless by the way you are powerful in prayer to the pulling down of strongholds, but you're powerless in a moment to change their circumstance. And if you only live in the natural, you're just going to feel, I'm powerless. It's simply because you've met a need, and now you've got to get on your knees and carry them to Jesus. You've got to lift them up to Jesus. You're no more powerful than when you're on your knees. I'm no more powerful than when I'm on my knees. John 8, 31, 32, and 36 says, So Jesus said to the Jews who would believe him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth that you know will what? Set you free. And so if the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. 
Some of you are here today and you're free indeed, though you're temporarily struggled or you temporarily have fallen back. Can I take a moment and remind you that no matter what the last two weeks have held, you are still the child of King Jesus. Can I remind you that your life is not meant to be lived in defeat, that you are still not only free, but you are on the pathway to freedom. So I don't want to just remind you who you are. I want to remind you the trajectory and where your life is going because your spiritual enemy today is whispering lies to you. But like we just sang, we serve a God who will kick down those walls, tear down every single lie, that your life is not destined to destruction, that it is actually on the path of freedom. It doesn't look like this. It looks like this. Keep moving. Keep pursuing. Today, I want to remind you that when you were the most successful as a follower of Jesus or you felt the hardest as a follower of Jesus, you are still a follower of Jesus. You are still a child of Jesus. It doesn't excuse what you did, but when it, ha- when it does, when you see with what you did, it doesn't define who you are because Jesus defines who you are. So they said, what what was that? What were you just doing right there? It's called spiritual warfare. Speaking the things that are not as though they are. So if someone's hungry, and and you can make a difference, then don't say, I'll pray that God brings you food. Make a difference. Likewise, sometimes there are spiritual strongholds or barriers which need to be broken. That could be thinking, emotions, dynamics, whatever it happens to be, of which prayer is absolutely pivotal. And in that moment, it may not only be helping someone who's hungry. It may be getting on your knees and asking God to do what only he can do. Don't be weary in well-doing. Some of us are really good at meeting the natural needs, but we need to grow a little bit on the spiritual side. And there are others of us, man, we are so strong on the spiritual side, but Jesus has got to put you right face to face with brokenness again. Because you've got to give out of the natural side as well. How many know it's not a question of either or? What Jesus is saying is both and. We need both these things. Ezekiel 22, verse 30 says, I looked for someone to stand up for me against all this, to repair the defenses of the city and to take a stand for me and stand in the gap. Everyone say in the gap. To protect this land so that I wouldn't have to destroy it. In other words, so it wouldn't be just robbed and and destroyed by the enemy. Empowering those who are in need is having the courage to stand in the gap between what is and what could be. Understanding that you are not the savior, you're not the healer, but you have a role to play. That God wants to use your life to make a difference. And sometimes it looks like handing out a sandwich. And sometimes it looks like lifting somebody else up to Jesus in prayer. The question isn't which one's better. The question is yes and amen. We need to fight with everything that Jesus has given us. Why would we as a church want to only work in the natural and tie one arm behind our back? As well, why would we only want to work in the spiritual and tie one arm behind our back? I don't know about you, but when it comes to the work of the enemy, I want both hands loosed on the enemy so that people can live in the freedom that Jesus has paid for them to live in. And I want him to use your life and my life to make a difference. And so as Pastor Lori said, and this we wrap up with here, is we have this beautiful opportunity as a church community that comes out of Acts chapter 2, verses 44. And it said that when we all do something, there was not one who had a need amongst us. And at Christmas time, there are parents, single parents and just parents. There are parents who don't lack love for their children. They're amazing parents. They just happen to be in a difficult financial season. And what happens is the stress of Christmas, right, can crush the parent and it can create a problem for the kid. But here's what we know at Life Center. I mean, that finances are a solvable problem. This is one side of it that Jesus was saying, here's something that we can do. And here's what we would never ask. 
We would never ask one person to meet the entire need. That's too heavy of a weight. But this is what I know. If everyone does something, I promise you, something miraculous and special will happen for every family and child in need. Those of you who are online, you can give online. Just designate gift for kids while you're giving online in a moment. But here's what I want to do. Because we want to take the natural and the spiritual and we want to pull them together. And so what we're going to do is we're going to together pray. And here's what we're going to ask. It's a very simple prayer. I'm going to tell you what it is, then we're going to pray it. This is the prayer. Jesus, what will you have me give for Gift for Kids this year? Right? Ask him for an amount. Right? Ask Jesus for an amount. And then don't give a penny more than that. Right? For some of you if, you, if you, if you really want to give generously, just ask for a moment for the person beside you. Just ask for their debit card and their PIN number. Just, <laughs> or ask the Lord to reveal it to you. No, don't. <laughs> and then give like you've never gave, given before, right? Why are we doing this? Well, Jesus said that we can hear his voice. You know what voice I never want you to hear at Life Center? Guilt, shame, or manipulation. Ever. So all I'm asking you to do is just be responsible. Jesus, what would you have me do? And give that amount and not a penny more. So let's pray. I'll lead you in prayer. So let's pray. Dear Jesus, what would you have me do? Forgive for kids. Speak now and I'll listen. we have families in need. And if you have the ability to do something, there's green envelopes in front of you in all chairs. And we're going to invite the ushers to come forward. And we're going to receive, don't do this often, but we're going to receive a second offering. But just before we do, so the ushers are going to come, but they're just going to stand. And we're going to take a moment. We're just going to sing this song together. And then we're going to pray. Before. So don't, don't collect yet. We're just going to stand because we're going to pray.